good. Very good. Um, so I'll start by saying congratulations on the movie. Thanks. It's going to be a huge hit. Thanks. I'm, I'm sure, I don't even know, do you follow like all the tracking? Are you like on it? Tracking, I follow, yes, yes. So you're, you're, Reviews, I don't read anymore. Okay, so you're aware it's going to be like this huge monster hit. Well, you always, it's like fingers are crossed, things look good, but I can never, you know, just count on things. Sure. You I'm know. willing to, I bet good money that it opens. Yeah, I know, massive. but what, like, you know, ice storms sweep across half of the United States, then it changes things. So you never, you know what I mean? You never know. You never know. But I, yeah, I mean, I'm very, I'm very happy. We, we seem to be in a good place. And Yeah, the reviews are also going to be really, like, it, yeah. Anyway, moving into the, uh, the first thing, which is probably the most important. I follow you on Twitter. I need you to stop tweeting so much because you really go a little too much. Like, it's like. Do you follow me? Do you yeah. follow me? It's like 24 times a day on Twitter. You're like yeah, constantly right. <laughs> retweeting things. It's obnoxious. I know. Actually, I could I could tweet a little more. I have I have a like a, a little bit of a tweeting issue. I mean, every once in a while, I sort of get um, I sort of want to update on the movie or something. It's always it's always the professional tweeting. It's tweeting about movies. Sure. I have an issue just tweeting anything personally, and you know I have an Instagram account, but I keep it personal um, for friends and family and things like that. Um, but I could tweet a little more, but sometimes I think, like, you know, just, like, little updates here and there are... Well, like, today, for example, you could have tweeted about to do the press conference with, like, a picture of all the journalists. True, yes. Like, hey, listen, this is... I, I see the way other directors do things, and... Yes. You know, just yeah. throwing that out there. I yeah. think I think people would like it, especially fans of the franchise. Yeah. Like, to just know how things are going in the editing room. You'd be, like, cutting real two today. Yeah, yeah, Or yeah. whatever it is. You know what? I'll make a promise. I'll tweet more. Okay. Starting today, I'm start tweeting more. <laughs> or I, actually, you know what? Maybe not starting today. Maybe yeah. starting starting post Thanksgiving. I'm going to be jumping back in the edit room, and I'm going to start starting Mockingjay two. Right. And I will start tweeting more. Okay. Well, we'll That'll see. be a promise, and you can give me a progress report next year. Um, okay. Well, hopefully that will happen. Okay. Before I jump into your excellent work with this movie, I have to ask you: yes. when you put in the Easter egg in I Am Legend, yes, um, of Batman Superman and the logo, yes, when that was there, did you realize that Warner Brothers was really going to take that logo and use it for Batman Superman? No. Because um, that's like the greatest Easter egg now that's coming. Yeah, to no, I know. It's actually really fun. No, you know, the reason that it was there is that the producer um, and writer of I Am Legend, Akiva Goldsman, actually wrote an early, early, and I'm going to get some of this wrong, I know, but there was, a, there was a weird thing where I think, I think Chris Nolan was supposed to do Troy or something, and... Somebody oh, really? else, yeah, and, and and there was a weird sort of mix-up of things where he was supposed to do one thing, and another filmmaker, I want to say Wolfgang Peterson maybe, was supposed to do Batman Superman, and it got switched around, that script got dropped, Wolfgang took Troy, Chris Nolan took the Batman movie, Right, and but now Batman it became his Batman trilogy. There was, and I know I'm getting it wrong, so please nobody hold me on this. But I remember hearing these stories. But Akiva wrote that Batman Superman, and this was years before. This was totally. before Constantine. Uh, and then we were thinking of, hey, like what movies would it be fun to put up that would have been on the screen when the plague hit that sure. caused all the damage? And he thought, okay, let's do Batman Superman. And just recently, I ran into Akiva. I hadn't seen him in a long time. And we were talking about it. And he actually said, you know, Warner Brothers actually never gave us permission to even put the, Warner, the, to put the Batman <laughs> Superman logo in there. I, I thought they actually, that we had gone to them and asked them and right. gone through legal and all that. But nobody actually ever gave us permission. Because I got to tell you, I don't know if you've seen the logo. But it is all Warner family. So no, I guess, totally. it, you know, yeah. what are they going to sue themselves? I mean, you know. No, but, no, totally. But, like, I'm sure that's why it went through. But, like... They're using a logo that's very similar to what you guys yeah, did. Yeah, that's really funny. Yeah, because like everyone yeah. talks about it. It's it's just you yeah. know like real early laying down the foundation. Yeah, no, works. and it was. I mean, that was all you know. Akiva and I. It was our idea as an Easter egg, and especially with his connection originally to to that material, and we just thought it would be kind of a fun thing to do. I, and I honestly don't even know where that the the logo came from. Uh, I don't know who did the design. I mean, yeah, but I didn't. What I'm saying is, I didn't hire an artist to oh, do a Batman Superman thing. It was somehow pulled from Warner Brothers. Again, this proves my theory that they've been laying down the groundwork yes. for a very long time. Yes. You know, jumping into why I get to talk to you today. Uh, how long? The movie's about two hours. Yeah. How long was your first cut? The first cut of this movie. So, um, you know, we shot these movies back to back. Primarily, we did the first one up front. So about two weeks from finishing, finishing shooting, I worked a lot more 
in the edit room this time because the turnaround was going to be so fast for part one. Um, worked a lot more in the edit room during the shoot. And so I actually saw an almost finished cut of the movie, uh, assembly of the movie, two weeks before we were finished in Berlin. We, we would get together oh, wow. in this conference room in a hotel, and we actually went through all the reels. And we were missing one sequence we hadn't even shot yet. But other than that, there was a two-hour, 25-minute movie, which was sort of perfect for me because I knew that it was, at the time, running a little slow, needed some trimming up and all of that. And my goal was to always make about a two-hour movie. I, I sort of thought that... You know, if we're going to take this book and distill it into two movies, it was not two two and a half hour movies like Catching Wire, Fire was, but it would be two two hour movies that could be a little more taut um, because we can sort of corral you know the stories down to to much more manageable length. Do you so the so it was like that was like an assembly version or that was like a real first cut? No, certain I had gone through some scenes and sequences quite a lot already. But what I hadn't done was I hadn't actually sort of worked through reels where you actually look through a reel and you work on the whole reel and then you link two reels up and then you work yeah. on those two reels together. I hadn't worked on it as a whole. So I was basically looking at an assembly of scenes that I had actually been in there and really worked on. And so scenes themselves were really working, but it was now putting them all together and seeing it as a full narrative. Um, that was really the first time I watched the whole thing front to back and saw. And at that time, it was about two hours, 25 minutes. Now, uh, I don't want to talk specifically because people are going to watch this before the movie comes out, but the, you, you end in a certain place. Was it always your intention of ending there? How did that change in the editing room or you know, how did you decide on that location? It didn't, it didn't the, the split in general, I will say, ends where it, we end it. Um, there was some wiggle room with scenes, so the split doesn't end exactly where the script stopped. We actually originally had, ta and now in the movie, when you see the movie, what the last sequence is was actually the beginning of part two uh. in script. Um, and so we actually sort of shifted that around a little bit. But in general story terms, we always intended on ending the movie where it ends now. Do you have a lot of deleted scenes from part one, or are this like stuff that you it's like part of the assembly, like, you know what I mean? Are there deleted scenes? That there are deleted scenes, yes. There are deleted scenes. We're going to put them on um, the DVD. I will say that I think that there, there were more deleted scenes in Mockingjay Part 1 than we had in Catching Fire. It was a, an amazing thing that, you know, Catching Fire was a long script, a long movie. We made up most of our time with sort of trims, but very little sort of wholesale scenes were cut out. Um, Mockingjay 1 actually has... a a decent amount of scenes that were just entirely like, lifted. Like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or five? I'd say, I'd say 10, 12 minutes probably lifted wow. out. Yeah. There's a, there's a big sizable scene that we had that was between, and this isn't a spoiler, between President Snow and PETA uh, that was probably a three and a half page scene um, that was just completely lifted. There's a scene that takes place in a, in a meadow. Um, does this come out before? No. This this will be. I'm gonna probably run this the day before the movie comes out, or the uh, day of the movie comes out. Okay. Or yeah. run it after if you'd rather me run it after. Uh, it's it's uh, it's up to you. But there's a there's a scene in the meadow that we uh, that's in District 13 that we cut out. Um, you know, so there's there's some scenes we cut. Um, do you envision? Obviously, with part two, I'm sure you're gonna have a deleted scene or two, possibly. Do you envision ever for fans showing the two movies back to back in theaters as like an extended? you know, four and a half hour movie or whatever it is. Is that something that you, you've even thought about? Oh, I would do that, yeah. Uh, your question's different than I thought. I thought you were going to say, would I ever put those scenes in? And the answer to that would be no, because I think the movies work better without them. Sure. But uh, I think it'd be fun, actually, to sort of link the two the two movies up. I mean, I, I've never thought about the sort of transition between the end of one into the next, uh, but it would be interesting to see them sort of butted up against one another into one long movie. That'd be that'd be kind of cool. I remember watching a laser disc version of The Godfather, but in linear order. Right, it was I, really fascinating. Well, what I was going to say is what they've done with the Hobbit movie, Lord of the Rings, is they've shown them all back to back. And I'm wondering if when part two comes out, if you would consider like theatrically, you know, arranging so you'd have all the movies play, and right after part one, it would just go into part two. Yeah, so, I think that would be that would be very cool. You mean instead of it going through credits and all yeah, that? Like yeah, no, I think that'd be that would be really exciting to do. Because I know I remember when Catching Fire came out. I think on the Thursday before, 
they started having these things where you could see the first movie and then see Catching Fire. I'm sure there's screening somewhere where you can watch the original Catching Fire and then this. Uh, it would be great to do that at the very end where you could see them all, but it really would, it would be nice to sort of clip the credits out and then maybe just play all of the credits for all the movies at the very end that, for all that, the various people. Exactly. I mean, it's just an idea, or at some point in the future, you know, like a marathon, whatever. I'm just, you know, yeah. throwing it out there. You did IMAX in the last one. Yes. We were talking downstairs, Kevin, you know, uh, but what was the reason why you didn't want to do IMAX in this one or in part two? Um, this was, you know, these these were very different sort of experiences, um, and I sort of felt like there was an opportunity to do IMAX um, with Catching Fire, and I found what I felt was a really organic way for it to sort of open up and change. There was a real point of view change where you're going up this elevator from the regular world into the arena, and it was the sort of perfect way you could kind of open it all up, and you're sort of experience and immersive immersive experience has changed for the arena and then you go back to the real world and it like goes back down again and then this one I never could sort of find the way of you know finding the organic way of kind of opening it up without it sort of opening closing opening closing and uh, I'm not just the the biggest fan of, of that. I think Chris I, Nolan does an amazing job with it, and he he's like he's the best by far with using I, I IMAX gotta, I gotta, to its I gotta, fullest. I got to say something real quick, and yeah. I think I speak for a lot of people. It's awesome when IMAX happens in a movie when it's a whole scene, yeah. but when the aspect ratio constantly shifts, it is effing terrible yeah. because you're constantly changing your eye line, and it's disrupt. It's like you're waking from a dream. Yeah. When it keeps on shifting. Yeah. That's just my two cents. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's also just me as a, as a filmmaker. I wanted to, and why it was appealing was that there was, a, there was like a moment of transition that was almost hidden. Like, oddly enough, you sort of, it gets sort of hidden in that elevator ride up, and the next thing you know, you're in the arena, and it, you're just kind of there in that format. And then when she passes out, once she's been, you know, pulled up, you sort of sense the change, just like she does, you know, and you sort of feel like, oh, I'm back. And it really worked kind of emotionally I, for Catching Fire, and I didn't know how to do that for these for these movies, um, and so we kind of totally shifted format and stuck with widescreen. And yeah, I got to tell you, it uh, totally good reasoning. I didn't I hadn't thought about it, but it completely makes sense, and it does work so well on the last yeah. one. Um, after the success of the last movie, did you have a lot of like? I'm I'm sure how it is with Lionsgate. Did you have a lot of execs like in the room with you, looking at the cut or giving you notes and like? Was it less notes this time? You know what I mean? Like, after you've been so successful, how does that change maybe the way people more hands-off? No, you know what? I, I, have, I have to say that all around from the beginning, it's been an unbelievably great experience. It's, I think part of the reason they asked me to continue on with the Mockingjay movies so early, because I was asked before we even started shooting Catching Fire, was that it just felt like it was the right group of people and the chemistry was right, and that includes the studio. So when I showed my first cut of Catching Fire, I did not have a lot of people sitting in the editing room. I mean, they saw the movie, they responded. They're smart people. They had a couple of notes. We talk about it. You make some tweaks. But we all want to make the same movie, so you feel like you're dealing with some smart people. And it's the same with Nina, you know, and, and John, the producers. Um, and so it was the same thing here, you know. I mean, everything's a new animal. You're hoping it all works. But I think we all went in knowing what the script is, liking the script, liking what we're shooting, um, you show the movie, and so now you're in a room with people you trust who are still wanting to make the same movie you want to make, so it's really just about fine-tuning a new set of eyes that are seeing it for the first time, and sometimes they notice something, and, and so it was great in, in both, but I wouldn't say that there's really, there's really any, any change. I'm sure for them, having seen Catching Fire um, and gone through the experience with me, that they're more comfortable. I mean, I was an unknown in the beginning, but um, they didn't treat me any differently in the beginning, I have to say. I'm basically out of time with you, so I just have to, I'm going to ask a few snap things. Uh, uh, with part two, um, where did you leave it? Have you, do you have any sort of rough cut, or are you were like really getting started right after Thanksgiving? Uh, I'm sort of in between. I, I have not seen the entire movie front to back. I've worked on scenes and sequences, so as this one was winding down, as part one was winding down, the editors and I jumped on the big visual effects sequences. We tackled those first, and so most of those have been cut and actually turned over to the vendors so that they can have the most time possible to work. Um, there's some really challenging effect sequences in the next movie, so we wanted to get them started on that. 
Um, and then after Thanksgiving, the editors and I are going to really dive in and start kind of working on the movie as a whole. Um, of course, I know you're a year away from being able to really look at other projects, but I would imagine once you've delivered, you know, you, you make good movies. So I would imagine you're going to have some opportunity to do what you want after this journey is over. Is there a genre or something that you're already thinking about that really piques your interest? Specifically, uh, and uh, she's going to laugh, but like the comic book genre is like the most popular on the planet now. Is that something you're interested in? Or are you wanting to tackle maybe like a romantic comedy? Like, what are you Yeah, no, uh, I don't think romantic comedy is my thing. I mean, I have to say, out of everything, comedy scares me the most. Um, I just think, like, I think I know how to make people cry. I know how to get, make, make people scared. <laughs> I, there's a lot I, I have some confidence in. Right. Um, comedy really frightens me. And, and, you know, in these movies, I feel really blessed to have people like Elizabeth and Jen, who's really funny even. I mean, you know, just people who are really funny around... Um, so I would say no comedy for me, probably. Um, I would also say it's unlikely I would do a comic book movie. I don't think it's impossible, but um, I, I did it with Constantine, and even though I Am Legend wasn't a comic book movie, it was yeah. in the realm of. Um, and, and I'm feeling a little sort of comic book fatigue right now in terms of just, you know, when you see 40 movies out there over the next six years or whatever, it's a little like, okay. But... If it was a great character and a great story and it was about something, I'd be totally into it. So it's really I, it's really about story for me. I'm speaking as a fan, though, because I love Constantine. Like, I'm, you know, I've said this before, but like, and I, I am legend as well. That's the reason for me. I'm speaking like I want a right. good director right. handling some of these things that I'm so interested in and sure. so many fans are. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, it's always po it's always possibility. I still, like, if somebody sends me a graphic novel, I still look at it. I'm not turning it away just because it comes from the comic book world. Um, but it's, uh, you know, I would actually say it's not a comic book thing that, I, that I'm sort of against. I think it's more of a superhero thing that I'm a little, I'm more hesitant to get involved with. I, I completely get it. Listen, I got to wrap. Thank you so much for giving me your time, and congrats on the movie. Thank you, man. <laughs>